Beautiful. All right. So let's get started. Um, as I said, my name is Ben Marshall. I work for Radio Parts and Pro 2 is one of our brands. We're going to be talking specifically about that as well as HDMI in general. And for anybody on the internet, hello. Um, my official title is product expert and resident geek here. So I'm supposed to know everything about everything that we have, which is an impossible task. So I try to know a little bit about everything we have. Um, today, though, we need to talk about HDMI how to use it, what's wrong with it, what's right with it, how it all works and everything else as it goes together. So to start with, you need to actually have a look at what a HDMI signal is and how it works. Because once you understand that, the rest of it can you know, work properly. And I want you to understand that I'm a little bit of a negative Nancy when it comes to HDMI because I generally get handed the stuff where it's gone wrong or where it's super complicated and we need to try and break it down and make it work properly in the first place. So. Generally speaking, HDMI is a rock solid signal if you do exactly what they designed it to do in the first place, which is pass all the video and audio information through 12 of the pins, bit of consumer electronics control, which can go really wrong. That's when you press play on your Panasonic TV remote and it plays the Blu-ray player that's connected to it, or hit the power button for your Foxtel box and it turns the power off the display as well. Supposed to be universal is not universal in practice. Uh, if you're having issues where things are turning on and off and they shouldn't, turn off CEC and off you go. There's the 14th pin that's here, which is the audio return channel. And then we get into the difficult stuff, as well as a hot plug and a 5 volt signal that comes through the cable itself. So there's a 5 volt DC you know, voltage that passes through all of these HDMI cables from end to end. Um, it can be used in a whole heap of different ways, but it's a good way of keeping the signal integrity high. These three are where our issues with HDMI come in, and they're to do with how the HDMI connection works from end to end in a software back end side of things. The information that's passed when you plug something in from your Foxtel box to your display, for example, is Foxtel box says to display, hey, I'm here. I support copyright protection, which is HDCP. What do you support? Do you support copyright protection? And what's your resolutions that you prefer to work with? The resolutions is the EDID information that comes out of it. So your TV then says, hi, I'm here. I support HDCP. Here's my keys. Here's my stuff that I use to encrypt you know, the HDMI and the HDMI signal. So it sends that information back down. And I also support resolutions of 4K, 1080p, 720p, and so on. Shoves all that information back down to the Foxtel box, and the Foxtel box goes, ooh, I'm a 4K Foxtel box. You like 4K? I like 4K. Your copyright protection looks good to me. Let's send a signal, and then it works. That's it. HDMI in a nutshell. Works brilliantly easily when you just do that. So if all we ever did was plug sources into displays, then life would be simple, and we never have to worry about it. And that's how the HDMI signal and design was made in the first place. That was what it was designed for. Run a maximum of 10 meters on a direct cable. No splitters, no switches, no matrixes, no extenders, no nothing else like that. And then probably about 30 seconds, if that, after they first said it, somebody came and said, I need to run 12 meters, what do I do now? And people went, um, let's make the cable thicker and see if it works. So they did. And so with a thicker cable, you can pass a signal without too much trouble. But I need it to run 30 meters. Uh, okay, that's not going to work so well, no matter how much of a hose pipe of a cable we put onto it. Um, let's build a repeater. We use the 5 volt signal that's in there to actually boost and send the signal further. So our 20 meter, 30 meter standard leads have got re active repeaters in there. They take some of the voltage, they amplify the signal, you know, make the signal better again, and then you get it out on your TV. Obviously, they've got electronics in them. Electronics fail over time. Voltage spikes, things happen to it. If they die, then the whole cable is dead. There's no copper to fall back on. The whole thing is just dead as it is. Okay, what happens if we now need to run 40, 50, 60 meters? The repeaters start to have issues over longer distances. So we started looking at HDMI over coax, HDMI over data cable, HDMI over fiber, HDMI over IP whole heap of different ways of making this signal work. And so we've kind of pushed HDMI a long way to make that happen. With HDMI over CAT, for example, over CAT cables, there are officially licensed HD-based T systems running 
you know, up to 40 metres at some resolutions of 4K, 70 metres at most resolutions of 1080, or most types of 1080p, and then there's versions that run 100 metres of 1080p and further and pass more information, including you know, Ethernet and control and infrared and everything else like that all over the one cable. That sort of stuff is really, really cool, but as I'll show you in a little bit, it starts to have problems when we start looking at the latest generation signals where you're running up around the Foxtel 4K standard of things. A HDC6L, like our little one that's here, is not an official HD Base 2 chipset. It's a different variation on it. So it runs a different length, different style of build inside, but it does the same sort of job. Runs over a nice long data cable from end to end. And I'm going to show you why I've got two data cables here in a little bit as well. There's a very important thing to consider when you're looking at these signals. All right, so that's the basic HDMI pin. Really cool, painful when it doesn't work. So the other part of the equation when you start looking at HDMI is what is the actual signal that you're passing through the cable itself. So the copper is the copper. The pin, the head is the head. There are micro versions, there's mini versions, there's an F version for automotive use that I don't think anybody's ever seen outside of the theory. Maybe some overseas products perhaps. But that copper is the same all the way through, that plug is the same. But now what I pass through the signal has changed over the years. When HDMI was first designed, the sort of signals they were thinking about were in this sort of range. With 576s, 720s and 1080s. Pretty simple stuff. Resolution's relatively low. Most of you have seen a 576 signal recently. If you've watched a DVD, you certainly have. If you've watched free-to-air TV on most channels, they're still running at about 576 resolution. It looks fine. On a good TV, it'll scale that up to match the TV and it still looks pretty decent. But it's not a wonderful signal. 720p is nicer. Full high def, 1080p for a 1080p panel is excellent. It's lovely, great thing. Then you've got 4K, and on the next slide we've got 5K and 8K and 10K and other stuff that's coming for it all as well. But the resolution's part of the equation. The other part is the frames per second or the refresh rate or the hertz depending on what you're actually measuring. From here we've got 50i, 50p, 50p, 24 to 30p and 50 to 60p. So we'll keep an eye on that as I start changing some of this stuff around as well. Chroma is an interesting little beast. Um, the complicated way of showing it is with a diagram like this one. So these numbers are on the side here. Luma is your brightness level. Chroma is your colors, your color information. And then you combine the two together to get your final signal for it. So, the light information doesn't take very much memory or bandwidth, so we leave it the same. The color information though, as you reduce, you know, instead of say parceling this part up into eight colors to match the eight bits of light that are coming through, if I now parcel this up and make it into two and two or four overall, I reduce the amount of data I need to send through the cable or the data of the signal itself. Now, if I reduce that even further down to this, this is about, I think it's about eight times less signal than this one is to pass through the same sort of cable. So by doing this, I can make a, an older system work really, really well. It just doesn't look quite as bright and colourful as a 444 better quality one would. In the end, when you combine the two things together, obviously you get a very different result for it that's there but this is a hell of a lot easier to pass than this one is, and this one's a lot easier to pass than that one. So the way I'd like you to think about it is 420 is reasonable. That's your normal standard def TV, normal sort of stuff you're looking at. 422 is better, much better, and 444 is currently the bee's knees of the signal and whatever you can do with it, okay? Going back to this point, 422. So on this page, Obviously, there's the chroma that we were talking about before, the 420s, the 444s, and so on, as it does it. I've got my data rate here, whether we're using a high, um, a high dynamic range signal, so that's the extended color palette, uh, sorry, extended color variation on a screen, the better lights and darks and everything else. My general way to think about HDR is look at a sunset on an old standard F. 
TV channel and you might have like these big, there's a big purple bit there, there's a big blue bit there, then there's a big orangey bit there and then there's a big pink bit down on the horizon. It's almost like you have to swipe the colour across in different bands. The more high dynamic range there is, the more it looks like the sunset in Fiji from when you were 15 years old that you remember about. That's where high dynamic range really helps. But to do it, you actually need more information, so more bandwidth to make the signal work through. And on the end here, I've got the HD base T thing as well. So whether it will work with HD base T or not. So obviously at our low resolutions, with even whatever color depth we throw at it, the data rate's pretty low. This 0.8 and 2.2 is fine. Pretty much any bit of copper will run that through from one end to the other. HD base T loves it. At 1080p, we go up a little bit higher in terms of gigabits per second, and obviously the colour depths there still passes through without too much trouble over most devices. Now we're starting to look at 4K, and 4K at different colour bit depths, and we start spiking up to around 11 or 13 gigabits per second for it. So an old school extender like this one starts to max out at about 10 points gigabits per second. So if I try to pass anything above that, then this is not going to actually work for it. And the 4K signal will not get through. The other thing I want to point out to you is that this is at 24, 25, 30 frames per second too. This isn't the 50 to 60 that most 4K signals like Foxtel are trying to push through and trying to send out. To do that, you're jumping up another step to here. Now, Foxtel itself is a good example because it's one of the biggest ones that sits on the market today. It's using a 422 chroma. It's using, I think, a 10 color bit depth. I didn't check that, but I think it's a 10 because they're trying to do something with HDR formats as it comes along. And it's basically running at almost 18 gigabits per second, which this definitely will not pass. The chipsets that are in this just can't pass that kind of signal. If you look at it, even the HD base T genuine big expensive versions of it, like this, have to compress part of the signal to actually get it from one end to the other. Now, I want to, that's a big key feature here, or big key point. Something like this one. So this is a version 2, 18 gig per second-ish capable receiver and transmitter and matrix and everything else is actually compressing part of the colour information to make sure that the HDMI gets from one end to the other. They pull some information out at one end in a predictable way and they put it back in in the other end in another predictable way for it. If you run a direct cable to a TV and then run this right alongside it, the differences are minuscule. If you're a real purist about video and audio qu uh, video quality, you'll spot them. You might see what's going on between them. If you're not, or if you're further away from the, pa the panel, you probably won't spot it at all. So they're great at doing it with that compression built in. Compression stuff's working out quite well, but it is still a compression method for it. But now, if I want the full chroma, so the full color information, this just starts failing. This starts getting too big for a standard cable or even a better 18 gig per second cable which gets into the scary territory of what's coming up now and in the future. There's pretty much nothing in Australia that does these sort of formats. There's test signals that they've been using at CES and other things like it. There's broadcast signals out of Japan and other things that have been testing at 8K, 5K, 10K and beyond. Uh, 5K is a little bit of an interesting one, but what I want you to look at is we're looking at 50 to 60 frames per second before. This is 100 to 120. We've doubled that. Not surprisingly, we've doubled the amount of, you know, uh, actual data rate that we need to run the signal through. A 5K signal like this one, so this is low frame rate, but 5K signal is actually marginal. It'll work with an 18 gig system. Anybody know what the market for 5K is, typically? It's computers and computer games. The 5K monitors seem to have a very healthy, it's a good size for distance ratio when you're sitting at a desk playing a computer game. So apparently 5K is going to be big for that sort of market. They don't like 24 to 30 frames per second because that's pretty jerky, horrible stuff for a video game. They want at least that and probably this. And if they start running that sort of signal, guess what? We're at 40 gig per second and a normal lead potentially won't work. 8K, 
that they've demoed at CES and other places along the way at different resolutions, and we start looking at ridiculous levels of gigabits per second, that even the best current spec for leads, which is this ultra high speed side of things, doesn't support, will not work unless you have to do compression on the signal at either end to actually make it get through, or use a cable that's got some active components that also compress the signal to make it work. So I'm putting this up here to scare you slightly, but this isn't stuff that's happening right now. These are you know, used over short distances on test benches in factories and so on to test how the signal's working and what might come out for it. But the scariest thing I found in all of this is that HDMI 2.1, which this is related to, or where it's come from, this, that copyright at the bottom is the bit that I want you to spot. That's copyright 2017. The spec for HDMI 2.1 that specifies all of those things and more came out a year and a half ago. And we're not, we haven't got HDMI 2.1 leads for a good reason, but extenders and so on are not getting up to that sort of range and to that sort of level. The manufacturers can't really work out how to do it. Trying to get 48 gigs through anything other than a copper to copper lead over a few meters is basically beyond them. So I guess my point with this is the technology in the back end keeps driving further and faster. We ask more out of the signal, but we're not necessarily getting the cables to actually match it. This is what HDMI 2.1 was designed to do. Add high resolutions, faster refresh rates, which we already talked about, more versions of you know, dynamic, high dynamic range, dynamic, high dynamic range, which is just a silly way of putting that in. The ultra high speed cable branding and monikers for it, Extended audio return channels, so more channels of audio being sent back from TV back to the source. More refresh rate features and auto low latency. Most of this stuff's coming in for the computer gaming world and market as well. It's actually quite a good little you know, PDF that they've sent out on all the specs and differences. They have color, you know, all the rest that's there. I'll let, send links out to people for that one. We'll you know, spec it online so you can read it up for further reference. But I guess my point with all this stuff is we're trying to push HDMI about as far as it can go now, but there is still more that we're going to ask it to do over the next you know, 12, 18 months, couple of years. And in terms of practical stuff that actually works with it, this is a lead that was shown off by a manufacturer we've dealt with before, a company called Fibber, F-I-B-B-R. They made a 56 gigabit per second HDMI over optical lead that you could tie in a knot and it would still work. So really nice technology, shown off as a sample, et cetera, product for it. But yeah, you can even see with that one at 56, yeah, we're sort of in the 8K at low refresh rate technology. So for an 8K panel running a movie, it probably works fine. But over anything bigger than that or better color depths or so on, then it's starting to have some issues. So that is more or less my, say, my point of saying that's all coming. This is all stuff we might have to deal with in future. For right now though, the signals we're typically dealing with are signals like Foxtel's IQ4. This is about the biggest signal available on the, mat, on the market here in Australia today. So I'm gonna talk through a few examples of how to deal with it and what to consider when you're actually putting together one of the, signal, uh, the systems, as well as how to test it and show off that it works and all that sort of thing as well. And so to do that, we ask a very basic question, which is, how do I get HDMI from here to there? And these are my little questions that I ask to pretty much anybody who wants to do it, or when I get asked. The first one is an important one, because how far does it need to go is sort of the key feature of the cables and the extenders. This is an old uh, flat cable from us that's a you know, couple of years old now was never tested for 18 gig in the factory or anything else like that, but passes the signal perfectly well. This is a three meter cable, it's even older than that. This is the seriously big flat days of HDMI cables. That also passes 18 gig per second. I think these are about six years old, five or six years since we started, you know, since we got those. So it basically wasn't a 4K signal back then or not very much of one. And this will do everything I can throw at it today, including a new Foxtel signal, which is quite nice. Over short distances then, a lot of old leads work fine. And I'm, 
really annoyed that I couldn't find, but I've got a three metre cord HDMI lead from 2006 that I bought. It cost me 200 and something dollars, roughly, and it passes an 18 gig per second lead, you know, a connection and signal. There was nothing like that back in those days. There's no 4K, 1080p was about as good as it got, and yet that cable still passes everything I can throw at it right now. So, good investment. 10 year old cable for 200 bucks, it's not bad. However, it was never tested for it. It may not work if I start putting 5K through it, 8K, 10K or more. Um, over short lengths though, even skinny little cables like this one pass a 4K signal without too much trouble. If you've got something active, something with a chipset in it, that's when it starts to become a problem because a chipset manufacturer is only going to build up to whatever the current spec they've been asked to build is. So 10.2, you know, or lower to run 1080p. This is a cable that doesn't have a chipset in it. It was only ever tested at the factory to run at 1080p-ish resolutions, really. Uh, 4K at low resolution, uh, sorry, at low refresh rates it can do. But I tested this out on the Meridio on the Fox and Hound tester and this will actually run a full 18 gig per second connection. This is a 10 meter non-active cable, it's just copper to copper and it will actually pass 18 gig per second but I've got no guarantee that the next one I pull out of the bag will, or the one from six months ago, because the manufacturer tests it to a point and says this is a 10.2, you know, 1080p, whatever lead. If they decide to change something in the head here to make it slimmer, for example, or they want to change the twist in the cable because it's cheaper for them to do it that way, it'll, it'll look pretty similar but it won't test out to 18 gig the same way it did before. So I wouldn't guarantee that every one that you ever sell like this is actually going to work. So, yeah, Harrison. Yep. Uh, they'll run all the way up to 18 gig. So with this table that we're looking before, 50 or 60 Foxtel 4K works perfectly well through those sort of flat cables, the standard ones. However, I can't guarantee that it always will, and I can't guarantee everything in the batch will, because it won't take a lot of variation for that to not work. The cords cable I spent all that money on all those years ago um, may have been slightly better built than a lot of the other ones, maybe better connections in the end, maybe I've treated it well over the years, that it still works the way that it's supposed to now. If I start passing 8K signals through it, who knows? And we'll test it as we come to that point. Right now, though, we have cables that are tested all the way up to 18 gigabits per second. The factory tests them, ensures them, does everything else they can to make sure that they pass the signal as much as it needs to be. So this is a current generation 3 meter 18 gig per second lead. It's a passive lead. No active components in it. There's no, no electronics. It's just copper to copper and gold pins to gold pins, essentially. That'll pass a full 18 gig per second connection. Pretty simple. Easy, you've used them, you've seen them. Nothing terribly special about it except we know and we test and we ensure that it will do 18 gig per second. If I start pushing it, here's a 15 meter lead. Now this 15 meter one's obviously bigger and heavier, a bit more like a hose pipe or a big RG6 or something similar. There is a source and a display end for this one. This is an active lead. It's got a chip that's in the display end that more or less changes and adapts and builds the signal again. So it'll pass 18 gig from end to end, but if you install it around the wrong way, I warned you, don't do it. Um, if it's run through a wall or a ceiling, guess what? You can't chop and change or run it backwards because it just doesn't work that way. Again, it's an active component. So if you spike a voltage along the line from a horrible HDMI component, if something else goes wrong, and the cable, the chipset fails, then the whole cable dies. So keep that in mind as well. If you want to go 10 or 15 meters, use copper. If you want to go 50, 100, 200 meters, we use fiber. And this is an active fiber lead, an active optical lead, in fact. Again, display and source ends for it. A bit more flexible than the other one is because we're using optical fiber to send the signal through instead. So. I can run HDMI with a direct cable up to 200 meters in length with stuff I have in stock now at the full 18 gig per second without any trouble at all. I can test that one out for you on the tester later, but I know that we've run those things for Foxtel 4K and it's worked perfectly.
so very happy with it. Over short distances, the old HDMI cables you've got sitting around will probably still work, but uh, if you're going to run it through a wall, test it first or buy a better lead, basically. On that one, I think it's might be five or six centimeters. So, uh, no, that'll still be just on the edge of it. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to run it at right angles around a, a joist in a ceiling or something similar. But yeah, it'll do quite well otherwise. Um, the yeah, those other ones that we're looking at there. Apparently, they can twist it in a knot and it will work. I'd be kind of keen to see how that works and see how well it goes. Okay, so that's short distances to medium to long distances with a direct cable. That works really well. And if you run that into a splitter or a switch or anything else, if it's all capable of 18 gig per second, the signal is going to get there, providing everything's 18 gig per second on the in and out and everything else along the way. Because now we're starting to get into technology, or into the problems of HDMI with EDID and HDCP and so on. So, when you send a signal one-to-one, -one, the TV says what resolutions it supports and talks about HDCP. What happens when I now put a splitter into the equation? This is a one-in, four-out HDMI splitter. HDCP works with this device and EDID works with this device. So my Foxtel box plugs into here. As far as the Foxtel box is concerned, this is a display. This is a TV sitting right here that it's plugged into. It does the HDCP handshaking, it talks about EDID and everything else like that. And so as far as the Foxtel is concerned, this is the end of the signal. Then from here out to each of my displays, it acts as a completely new HDMI signal and passes either the copyright protection through or the EDID from the display back to this thing here. So I've now got four identical displays plugged into this thing. They're all 4K you know, identical displays. Fox sells 4K in, 4K out to everything. Everybody's happy, no worries, no problems. What happens if I've got one 1080p display onto all of these, on the, you know, with the three 4K ones? Well, guess what? Unless that panel works out how to deal with a 4K signal, you're going to have to reduce everything to 1080p to make it work. So Foxtel, tell it that it's 1080p. Use the EDID switches here to manually say this is an, a 1080p display for the Foxtel and a 1080p source for the other displays that are coming through. And now all your lovely big 4K panels are running 1080p inputs because of that one cheap TV on the whole system that's there. So you can upgrade the panel or use something like a scaler to actually adjust just for that leg. Run 4K to everything and then scale down that one panel to 1080 if you need it to. I'm talking about best case here. You might have a 720 panel that came out of a caravan from 10 years ago that's still plugged in upstairs. It's cheaper to replace it than it is to try and sort of reduce the resolution and deal with 720p to all of your panels all at the same time. So EDID here, very, very important. Don't buy a splitter, switch, or anything else like that without it. Although with a switch, it's a slightly different story. So that's my splitter. This is a switch. It has no EDID that's on it. It's got three inputs, one output. So my output device is whatever my output device is. Let's say it's a 4K TV, because this is an 18 gig signal, 18 gig uh, switch. My three inputs that are here, they can be whatever resolution they need to be to make it work. So it could be a 1080p here, a 4K here, a 4K here. Because when you're switching between them, you're making that connection again, each time you're doing it, connecting up to it from there. So it's a little bit more robust. It doesn't need the EDID in there to do it. Although there are some switches that do if you really want to force your hand. You can choose a resolution for your sources that suits your output. So if it's 1080p TV, go into your Foxtel 4K advanced display settings, change the resolution to 1080 and you'll be happy with this. Simple enough. Um, things like the signal managers and scalers. So a scaler, its pure job is essentially to go from 4K down to something else. So if I've got one, you know, one 1080p link on a 4K system, I use this on that link where I've got issues. Same with 720p or anything else that comes along for it. We see a lot of these with things like uh, digital projectors, particularly business ones that are of 1610 or other unusual resolutions. A good scaler like this Bluestream one can actually pick some of those visa resolutions as well as 1080s and 720s and the rest as well.
useful thing to have in your bag of tricks. But this is my favorite little products that Bluestream sell, even up to and including their massive matrix systems. This is what's called a signal volt power supply, HDMI in on one side, HDMI out on the other. You can embed audio, so you can introduce an audio signal to the HDMI if it already doesn't have one, or you can strip the audio signal out to run it to an amplifier, a sound bar, or some other sort of device along the way if your TV doesn't work that way. But what it really does is allows you to mess with the signal on that particular HDMI chain and work out what's happening. So if all the panels are working but that one's not, put this thing in line with it and start messing with the EDID switches until you get something that's stable and you go, ah, this is a 720p panel. Because I've set this to 720p, it works. All right, I know what my issue is. I've got a 4K system, but I'm not getting 4K onto the TV screen. All right, I'm going to manually set it to 4K here and see what happens. Oh, it looks like my splitter isn't recognizing the 4K display. I need to switch this and change it. Again, that's where the signal manager comes in. It's even got a mode switch on here. So when you did the HDCP thing before, this acts as a source and display device for HDCP from one end to the other. You can also use the mode to pass that HDCP information straight through from one end to the other. So if Foxtel is not happy, pass the HDCP through and then this TV is talking to the source directly. And that's another issue that happens a lot with HDMI signals. Really useful little thing to have in your bag of tricks if you're an installer. And they're at 250 bucks retail, I think, 250, 279. So definitely worth having on hand. All right, so the signal manager kind of brings me to my next step, which is to start talking about how to actually test a signal properly and how to understand what's going on with it. The signal manager gives you a basic idea. As you play with it and work out what works or doesn't work, it'll tell you, hopefully, what went wrong. If you really want to understand it, you need a proper test tool like the Meridio Fox and Hounds. It's a long-winded name for basically the ultimate HDMI field test kit. It comes as a generator and analyzer pair. You've got HDMI output at one end and an input on the other device. The generator part of this can generate any signal from 18 gig per second, 4K, HDCP 2.2, 8 channel audio with HDR, etc. Can do all of that and generate that signal from here. So if you want to emulate a Foxtel box, you choose the right resolution, choose the right refresh rate, choose the color bit depth, everything else that you want to do, and then plug this into the rest of your system. You can test a lead out that way. You can test your panel and see whether it can cope with the Foxtel 4K signal and everything else just by using this little box to do it. It'll also do things like the visa resolutions for corporate projectors and so on. So if you're doing a job for somebody and they haven't actually got the laptop there that they're going to plug into it, which is pretty common, plug this in through your distribution system up to the projector and make sure it works at all the resolutions that people are likely to come across. And then you know that when you walk away, they'll bring in their laptop, plug it into the thing in the wall, and it will work with almost anything that they can possibly bring across and anything that they can work on. So very, very useful little thing. The other end of it is the analyzer side. So if you've got a distribution system with, say, Foxtel, again, running all the way through, and it's not working on a particular panel, plug this thing into it, and then work out what's going on from there. There's a HDCP button on the front of it. Is HDCP getting where it needs to go? If it doesn't, it won't show up. On the status that's here, it'll show whether there's a link, whether your cable's dead, whether something else is going wrong with it, just by that. It'll also show you the information about the signal on the screen, what resolution, refresh rate, what colors coming through, what uh, audio channels are coming through, the whole lot in one go. So I'm gonna set this thing up with my little camera here so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But this is a little bit fiddly and not quite as uh, nice as I would like it to be, but hey, it'll work for what we're doing here. Beautiful. It would be great, except that's a photo. Let's go back to this. Yeah, there we go. All right. So just going to power these up, and then we'll run a few little tests with it to show you how these things work. And yeah, I know the the. Uh, it's going to be a little bit hard to see these displays, but I'll do my best.
All right. So generator is this little one. Analyzer is this one, thanks to the name that's on the top. So let's do a non-complicated test just with a short one meter flat HDMI cable. Plug this into my generator side and plug this into my analyzer side for it. And then we wait. So at the moment I'm pushing a 4K signal from one end to the other. You can see that's come up. Beautiful. So I've got, I can change my display patterns and other things around and it goes from end to end and makes the signal happen. There's my 1080p going through it. I can play with the resolutions and make sure it works. But this is not complicated because this is a one meter lead. This should work for pretty much everything unless the lead's actually damaged. I can also do a cable test. So if I hit my cable test button here, you can see I've got options for different you know, bandwidths that I can try and force through this cable and see what works. So let's do the ultimate for, you know, 18 gig per second one. We've got OK on the 5 volt, then we'll have data channels, and then we'll have the other ones come up. And if this fails, then I've damaged the lead between an hour ago and now, which is entirely possible. But no, it all works fine. That's an 18 gig capable lead. Great. I can plug that into Foxtel and know it's going to work. All right. That was an easy test. That's a one meter one. Who wants to test or see me test our old 10 meter HDMI cable? This is the big round one. It was never tested in the factory at 18 gig per second. It was never specified for it or anything else. This one is also X return stock from the floor. So goodness knows what condition it's in or who used it and how it all went together. It's a bit hard to sort of plug this in both ends to show them both at the same time, but I'll just do the same cable test I did before and we'll take a second or two to do its testing thing. And let's see how we go with this. Bingo, that's an 18 gig capable 10 meter lead. Works perfectly. Can't guarantee the next one out of the bag will, but I guarantee the installer that brought this back and said it was faulty was wrong. There's nothing wrong with the cable. There's something wrong with the understanding on the job or with something else that the job was causing problems. So it's nice for us to have these here to be able to say, well, this is sellable again, or well, not after I've manhandled it a lot, but it is a lead that does work and it works fine. I can do the same sort of thing with the 50 meter optical one that's over there and the, the active copper one as well. Um, but you sort of get the idea. Um, HDMI through an 18 gig capable lead works pretty easily and pretty well. Um, and testing leads that are being tested by the factory at better standards than I have access to here is probably a little bit pointless for this demo, but rest assured by an 18 gig lead, it'll pass 18 gig and Foxtel 4K. So by 18 gig leads. Cool. So what I want to run is a little test here on something different. So I've got two different leads and I've got a wall plate, just a little mech that I'm putting in the middle of it. So I've got uh, this cable running into here and I've got the other one when I actually plug it in running to the other end. So it's three meters plus three meters plus a little wall plate that's in between the two. Now I'm going to run my cable test and I'm going to do this at an angle, at a jaunty angle because it's fun. And we'll just let this thing do it, run its test. Now all I've done is plug these two cables together and add a wall plate mech in the middle of it. And it works. If I'd run the other mech that's over here for it, hopefully this will also work. But this mech, neither mech was actually certified for 18 gig per second. And if the cable runs are too long at either end, the mech might be just enough to make it fail. And hopefully this will work too. It does. Short leads either side, this is still working fine. Would I recommend you do it? Absolutely not. Definitely not. Because I've tested this one out, doesn't mean the next 50 out of the box are going to work that way. Now, every time you add a join into a cable like this one, there are some losses. There's some problems that can come up for it. There's also mechanical connections either side. If something's not quite right, then the signal's going to fail. 
Running a direct cable to cable connection from one end to the other is a much, much safer way of making sure that your system works. When it comes to running via data cable, like this, every manufacturer says don't use cable mechs, don't use patch panels, run directly from one box at one end to one box at the other end. No joins, no connections, no nothing in the middle of it. Now, that is a little bit of a hard one for a lot of people because they've had their houses pre-wired. The basic thing with it is that little variation in the signal between those mechs and everything else can be enough for the whole system to fail and stop working. And what I want to show you here with these two cables is the difference between two different wiring schemes for data cable. So this one is CAT6 wired in TIA 568A spec and this is the one that's run in B and I've got our little HDC6L here so this is the standard uh, sort of standard 1080p tester that we use or that we extender that we use all day every day this is going to be a bit ugly here but let's just do this grab this one and this one again now what I've done here is because this is B-spec, this is the way that the factory recommends that you wire your data cables for a HD base T or clone HD base T connection. So if I run this through and into here, it's going to be hard to see, but we should. It's all powered up. Run a 1080p source. And info at this end for it now. Have we got sync? No, we haven't. This is also my, uh, my cabling or my connection, so hopefully I haven't stuffed it up. Da, 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 da. And we are getting nothing through from end to end now, where it was working perfectly before. Oh, this is always good. Do it live 50 times and it'll fail the one that you're doing. Actually, <laughs> I'm actually proving my own point. Okay. I'm an idiot. This is the A-spec one. I didn't mark them differently, but I put them back down in the wrong order when I put them down from the last session. So I proved my own point by making myself look like an idiot. Um, How do you know it's the uh, I looked at the end of the plugs. So with an A-spec cable, the plugs are wired up slightly differently. So with this one, it'll be impossible for you to see, but the green connection, actually, see if it comes up on this. The green connection is on the right-hand side. It's on the outer edge of the connector. These sort of HD base T, et cetera, chipsets, the green, green, white pairs, what actually carries that EDID and HDCP information. It's the most important part of the entire signal is on the green, green, white pair. Obviously, when I'm doing this, plugging this all in, HDMI end to end, I'm only pushing a 1080p signal through and nothing's working. Got no signal, no nothing from end to end. This is a 40 meter bit of Cat6 cable. It's also falling off. That's running from there. If I switch this, now let's hope, hope that my demo does what it's supposed to do. This is another 40 meter Cat6 run, identical except I've run the different spec connections from end to end for it. If I plug this in. Try and move this out of the way. And where's my... Run that. Connection, connection. Again, it worked. Ah. Mm -hmm. Good. Pay attention. When you're playing with HDMI, get the cables around the right way. So you plug the generator into the transmitter end and the other end into the other end. That will also make things work a little bit better too. There we go. So that's B-spec. It's working all the way through. 
great 1080p signal, no problem at all. If I try to push a 4K signal through it, even say 24 hertz, so a low refresh rate version of it, I will probably get nothing from end to end. It just doesn't pass 4K. It just won't do it. It's not designed to do it. The chipsets aren't capable of that. Go back to 1080p, switch it, control it, signal comes through, and when it resyncs, there it is. No problem. And just because I should, I'll go back to the other one and make sure of it. So keep that in mind when you're running extender or if you're fault finding somebody who's running an extender, use B spec for the data cable, don't use A. And make sure that you're not running into mechs or wall plates or data switch, well, certainly not a data switch, but no uh, patch panels or anything similar. And yes, now we're running exactly the same way that we were, but the A-spec cable's failing at 40 metres. So big fault finding thing for anybody that's doing this for yourself to make sure of that and make sure that's working properly. Okay, let's finalise all of this with a few little general tips when it comes to HDMI. My first point that I normally ask people is how long do you want to run the cable? And if they say a short distance, you can use pretty much anything you want. And that is anything below five meters for now. If they change the spec in future, those three meter, five meter, two meter cables may not work in future. But for now, everything we can throw at it, they work fine. If they want to run further than that, you also need to ask what kind of signal they're trying to run. Is it a Foxtel 4K signal? Is it 720p out of an old, you know, cheap Blu-ray player or a media player? Is it an old analog set-top box? Is it whatever else it is? And that'll determine what you're doing. So you can use whatever lead you feel like that works over those sort of distances. If you want to be sure, use an 18 gig per second lead. If you want to be sure at any length, use an 18 gig per second lead. If you need to extend it, if you need to switch it, split it, do anything else like that for it, Again, understand what your sources are. If it's only a 1080p source and they're looking at never changing that over, probably something like this will work very well and very easily for you. If they are looking at Foxtel 4K, make sure it's 18 gig per second capable, whatever else you use in the system. Every lead, every extender, every repeater, every switch, every splitter, make sure they all support it at every stage. If you're buying a splitter, to do a job, make sure it's got EDID on it and that you know exactly what you're plugging into and out of it. Because if you know what all your resolutions are and what all your devices are, then you can prepare for that and make sure that this thing works. If you don't know what the products are, you may have to allow for things like scalers to sit in the system. So you can choose what resolution you want for the panels that don't support what everything else does. That one row panel, that one row projector might need something like that on it to make it happen. If you're installing, take one of these with you. Keep it in your van. You may leave it at the job site to fix the signal and make it do what it's supposed to do if none of the rest of your gear can do it. Or this might be the test tool that you need to understand what's going wrong and how to fix it. And lastly, well, second lastly, HDMI fibre is a thing for longer distances. Again, if you want to custom run cabling, if you want to future proof it, run fibre. Um, the short answer for all the HD based T guys and the rest of it is that in future, they're looking at all of the chipsets to do this stuff. It's probably going to have to pass by fibre rather than by copper. They just seem to be maxing out what you can actually do. We run the clear line fiber here. It's probably the easiest, to, well, it is the easiest to terminate and the least dangerous of any kind of fiber I've ever come across. Um, HDMI of a fiber 4K extender, they're about $500 for a set. Then you buy the SFP modules that stick into it, then grab your fiber and you can run the signal 10 kilometers if you really want to. And that will work just fine. Lastly, very lastly, the point I want to make about uh, HDMI on bigger systems is beyond about an 8 by 8 so 8 inputs, 8 outputs, the value in a HDMI over IP system or HDMI over a network solution is much, much more attractive. You can have as many inputs to as many output devices as you like. 
Some computers will be able to pick up the stream without needing anything else. Some smart TVs, if you get the right system, will also be able to pick it up without needing any other hardware. But if you've got something, let's say a sports club, where they've got, say, 10 Foxtel boxes, and they've got 35 TVs now, but they're going to add another one in that area, and then maybe another one later to there, and another one to there, you can try and pass, uh, you can do it via modulation, RF modulation at 1080p, works fine. Or you can use a HDMI over IP system that allows you to switch and split and control it all via an iPad app or something similar. So the control side of things and the scalability of the HDMI over IP is where it really starts to be attractive beyond 8x8. Eight eight. Okay. Um, there's probably more I can tell you and certainly more I can show you on the generator and analyzer, but I guess my basic lessons are use 18 gig for everything. Make sure you've got EDID switches on all the components you've got, if you can. And if in doubt, call your resident geek or product expert or any of the guys here and we'll try and help you out with whatever's going wrong. And hopefully, that will help. Um, do you have any questions for me or anything in general, feedback or information that you'd like to know on any of the stuff that we've talked about? So you're basically saying with some of those um, wall plate type scenarios or you know, a situation where you might, a person might have a, a, a cabinet mm. where the amplifier goes in, yeah. but because of constraints you might have to get like a, a right angled HDMI adapter or something similar, yeah. But you're saying the, the adapters are the weak link? They can be the weak link, definitely. They might just be the one thing that tips over the signal from working to not working. Um, I've tested probably 10 different types of these adapters out over the last two weeks, and eight of them failed when I ran that same test, the three meters, three meter, plus this bit in the middle of it, at 18 gig per second, and then it failed at 1080p as well in some cases too. It's just, when you run a wall plate mech like this one in, say, a classroom situation, people are plugging into and out of it all the time, and they end up damaging the mech replace it, put a new one back in, and so on. But the damage that happens might be enough to knock out a 1080p signal, or it definitely will knock out an 18 gig per second lead. When you're running it in the wall at home, you can test it out and use the right gear to make it work. You should be fine if things aren't moving around. But until you can account for all the losses and things that are involved in these, it's probably not going to help you out very much. If I run this into a 10 meter lead, for example, and into one of these threes, we'll see if that actually still works or it doesn't work at all. Um, it's a useful little test to see. I was running three and three meter leads before. This will be a 10 and a three meter lead. And I'll get rid of my extenders because I don't need them right now. I guess my point is, if in doubt, don't use wall plates. And if you can avoid it, use things like bullnose wall plates, calf nose, reverse bullnoses, Pro 1272s with slots and brushes and things like that, just so you can pass the cable directly from end to end. Give this a fair shot. I won't use the flat lead. Yep. Oh, yeah, that one too. Yeah, exactly. Our modular plates that we do, the three section modulars, rather than the sort of clipsal inserts like these, um, we got that built. It's basically a notch so that you can run the cable straight through it. So you still have a nice neat wall plate. The cable can't fall back inside or anything else, but you're getting the full benefit of cable to cable from end to end. So that I can't test out here, I'm afraid. That's just a, uh, that's just as it is. All right, so let's run generator 10 meter into the extender, to the plate to here. Let's run Let's have a look here. 1080p works fine. End to end. Lovely. That's how it should be. But let's do a cable test at, why not? Let's try and kill it. Go for the top. So this is an 18 gig cable test. I've got 10 meter cable coming out of the generator into the extender and then through a 3 meter 18 gig lead right out to the other end for it. This cable tests at 18 gig. This cable tests at 18 gig. When I put the little piece in the middle of it, it fails. So over the three to three that I was testing out before, it works fine. 
as soon as I plug the 10 metre version in, the thing drops out. So I'm going to switch the ends around, put the 3 metre end as my generator, and then use the other end as my analyzer. And we'll do that same test again. So running the short length into the plate and then the 10 metre length out from it from there. Sometimes that's enough to make a difference, but we'll just see. So think about this as a scenario. I've got my projector up there, I've got a 10 metre cable running around to my wall plate that's here, and then I've got a little 3 metre lead that plugs into my uh, laptop from there. And yes, the signals failed on that one as well. Here's the shorter version of that same thing. So this is just gold-plated connection one side, gold-plated the other, PCB, nothing in the middle of it. So there's no extra bit of cable and connection. We'll see if this has the same effect. Okay. Do that same test again. So you can see it doesn't take much for this signal to start failing at the 18 gig level. Um, obviously a 3 metre and a 3 metre plus the little section in the middle, that's probably about a 7 or 8 metre combined total, so it's just pushing it. Yeah, even the little not much to it connection is failing over that sort of distance. Now let's give it one more red hot go. Instead of the 10 metre old cable, let's use the 15 metre active one. Now my display end is here, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to fit this on the plate as, as well as I did before, on the table that is. So, display end on the analyzer, which is where it's supposed to be. And the other end's going back to the generator just through the little mech in the middle. And we'll do that same test. So we've got an 18 gig 15 litre lead and an 18 gig 3 metre lead together with the mech in the middle. Let's see what happens. And it passes. So just that difference in quality between that lead, which passes 18 gig on its own, but when we start pushing it just that little bit further, it starts to fail. So I guess this is one of those cases where if you don't know what's inside the wall, don't risk it. If you do know what's inside the wall and you've tested all the components out, you might be able to squeeze it and get away with it, okay? So useful things to know, and I think I'll just do the same thing on that little short lead. Shouldn't make any difference, but hey, why not? I've tested all the other ones out, I may as well do this one as well. Um, same sort of idea when we're talking about data cable connections and systems like this one. Um, any joints or connections in the middle, we don't know what the quality of the punch down is, we don't know what the quality of the mech is, the pre-made patch lead you've got, and so on and so on. Even if you're running B-spec from end to end the way you're supposed to be all the way through, there might be just enough variation in it that it works. Now this is interesting. It's past these two, but there's a serious number of errors in the signal that are coming through. So, this doesn't fully pass an 18 gig signal, and Foxtel would probably spit it if you plug this into it, in this configuration, the way that it is here. And that's, the only difference is that little short version versus that one there. So we're talking about minuscule differences that it's not worth your time trying to mess around with. Try to avoid it if you can. Um, Yes, what else can I tell you? Yeah? <laughs> I would love to say that, and I do say that, except at a retail price of $3,700, it's not something that everybody can afford to take with them everywhere they go all the time. Things like those signal managers can help with that. You know, changing resolutions on your source device and testing it out. Well, on your laptop, try and produce a 4K signal, try and produce a 1080p, try different refresh rates if you've got access to them. Um, all of that will help you work out what's going on if you don't have access to these sort of kits. The only thing that I wish this kit did do, and it doesn't, is it doesn't produce reports. So you can't walk away from a job with an automated report saying we tested cable 123A and it works at 18 gig per second and all these different resolutions. 
this sort of device isn't designed for that. That's probably the $10,000 version of the same thing that will do those sort of reports. But for a, I don't know why something's going wrong situation, this helps. For a, I've damaged something and I don't know what it is, this can help. Where there's a problem, these can help. If you want to test a signal before you've got access to all the other equipment, these sort of things work out. At $3,700 retail, it's going to take a little while to recoup those sort of losses, you know, in terms of an overall figure. But if your call-outs are costing you $100 or more each time you have to go back to fix something, it doesn't take all that many of them for this thing to start to make a lot more sense. If you're working with a group, and we deal with a lot of different groups of installers, those guys should have at least one of these things in their office at all times to test this stuff out and work out what's going on because they'll need it on a job site somewhere today and another team on another job site will need it tomorrow and the day after and the day after and they make a lot more sense in that environment too. Um, there was something I w just was thinking about and I wanted to bring up when it came to this stuff as well. Um, oh yes, in terms of testing out HDMI leads, one of our reps here, Joe, had a customer that had uh, one of the it was a 15 or a 10 metre version of 10, I think, wasn't it, uh, of these? Uh, it was a 15, all right, so it was this cable. He had, this cable had been installed in a wall to run a 4K for Foxtel to a panel, new 4K panel. It's coming up with errors, basically saying no signal. Um, we didn't know what was going on, so we went out there with the generator and analyzer to have a bit of a look, and we, he'd taken another cable, run it across the ground, and it worked fine. It was just that cable that was in the wall. We thought, oh God, if we got the first one of these that's failed, where something's gone wrong with it. And sure enough, yeah, it definitely had failed. When I ran the tester through it, a whole heap of different signals, I just couldn't get a sync from one end to the other. It was intermittent. Yeah, that's yeah. Intermittent at the start, but by the time we got there, it just wasn't running a single signal from end to end for it. So, easy solution. Cables failed, it's a problem with the manufacturer, right? Okay, then you have to find out more about the actual job and what had happened to it. The AV installer hadn't installed it himself, he'd handed it over to somebody else to run the cable. Warning sign number one. When the other guy had run the cable, he's never run an 18 gig cable before, didn't know anything about it or whatever else, but he treated it more like a draw wire than he treated it like a HDMI cable. And so we you know, asked the AV guy if he could manage to get that one out. We'd love to have it back because we'd love to see what failed and what went wrong with it. Um, I think he sent us photos of it. In yeah, it was up the, yeah. Behind the fire I couldn't get the cable out. Yeah. The fire but he got into some of it to see what was going on, and he basically bent it at right angles around ceiling joists, and it had been squeezed in the back of something, so it had been almost broken at the back of the plug and other things as well. So there was nothing, well, the cable was dead, but it wasn't anything to do with the cable itself. It was uh, the install that had killed it. So the test tool gives you a certain amount of information there, but you've still got to understand who's used it in the end and what went wrong with it. If something's working and then it doesn't work, the first question you ask is, what's changed? And when they say nothing, you say, no, seriously, what's changed? Between it working and not working, what did you do differently? Oh, I changed my modem, my router, my TV, my Foxtel box. I changed this, I changed that, I unplugged this, and the dog chewed on the cable for a while and it didn't work. So, yeah, understanding that's going to be great for us. And fault finding for our guys on the floor and on the phones as well. Um, I've got plenty of other cables and gear to test out up here, so if anybody wants to see it or have a play with the meters themselves, they're more than welcome to coming up. Um, any other questions about HDMI and what's coming and what hopefully we can do about it? Just let me know. Um, and I'm trying to throw together little cheat sheets for all of you on the questions to ask and to give out to people as well. We'll put that up on social media so people get an idea of where to start when, it's, when you start looking at this sort of signal and how it goes. Beautiful. Are there issues with static? What's that, sorry? Are there issues with static? As in electrostatic discharge, ESD yeah. sort of stuff? Um, there can be. Um, anything that's got an electrical connection that's exposed can be, you know, can have problems with ESD, but generally, if these things are plugged into their devices, they're generally going to make quite a good match in there, and the only bit that's likely to show is the ground or the outside part of it. 
at the other end, the same sort of story, the ground to ground. So there shouldn't be too much of a discharge, and if there is, it'd be going through the shielding or through the grounding layer for it, rather than through the rest of the cable. If the end was exposed, the pins are sort of recessed and in there. In a really bad environment, say outside dust storm, you know, high humidity environment, perhaps there would be some chance of a discharge across the connections, but you almost have to have the cable uh, exposed, I believe, for that to actually do anything. Because I always mention have everything off hmm. when you're interconnecting. Sure. The big issue when you're interconnecting, uh, as far as I remember it, is with the 5 volt signals and the way they're handled internally and the hot plug detect side of things for it too, but it's mostly the 5 volt side. When you're connecting in and out a hot connection like that one, you know, from end to end, if whatever's in here isn't protected properly or it's a cheap version of it or whatever, you can send the voltage where it's not supposed to go and that will tend to fry chips on the board or in the extender or something else as it goes through. No, not in this case it's not, but it's, it's something that's pretty rare. It's, you know, it's not something that's, uh, yeah, it's not something that's going to come across very often, particularly with good equipment, but it can kill HDMI sockets on AV receivers, for example. So plug in, you know, this from there to there, and the TV's live, and the amplifier's are live, and you just unplug, replug, and so on for it. Then, yeah, you can kill the chips and the actual sockets in the back of the unit. Um, I've seen it probably twice or maybe three times in all the years that I've been playing with HDMI stuff that's here. It's also really hard to work out <laughs> because you've sort of, it was working or it's not working. Generally while you're plugging and unplugging, you're not sure if something's working anyway. So is it something you did that failed it or is it a coincidence? Is it something else? You know? So it's pretty hard to detect until you pull a pro component right down to its board level or PCB level and kind of go, oh, that chip's failed, it got a voltage spike from you know, being plugged in when it wasn't supposed to be. So good practice is not to do what I've been doing here, which is unplug and replug HDMI live all the time. Only reason I've been doing it is I know all of the products that are here and how they work, or I own them, so if I kill them, it's my own damn fault, basically. Um, apart from this one, and I know it's very well made, so I don't have to... I don't have to spend $3,700 well, $3, of my own money buying it if I kill it. So, um, Or we return it to the manufacturer and they fix it and say, we don't know what went wrong, like everybody else does. Um, yeah, so general practice, have things turned off. The other part that can happen when you're doing live connections is the HDCP EDID stuff may not be going through properly too because the TV's already gone through part of its cycle. You're unplugging in the middle of a, you know EDID transfer or something similar and suddenly the connection dies and you don't know why it's died. So that can cause you problems too. But uh, in general, most people do it and things survive. Uh, if you want to be 100% sure, don't, I guess is the way to put it. Um, cool, what else can I tell you? That's probably it for now, I think. Um, yeah, anything else, come up and see me and have a bit of a play and we'll try and work out what's going on. So we'll Thanks very much. To, we'll go to, um, like you said, the... Sure. Uh, the HDCL extender mm -hmm. work on uh, yep. uh, the 4K, so when will they produce a unit that The short answer is I don't know. Um, I know they're working on it, I know the factories are working on it. We'll have samples, I think, soon-ish that we'll be testing to see how well it works for it, but we tend to be fairly conservative with these things. We don't want to bring it out until we know it works all the time in every case that we can. Um, I don't know of anybody outside of uh, the high-end professional brands like Bluestream, Extron, AV Pro, Kramer, and so on, that has a like a cheaper or a generic HD base T extender running 18 gig per second yet. I don't think any of them do. Um, so it will be a while until they work out how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and it took us a while to come out with our versions of these things when there was an official HD base T chipset as well for it. Um, the short answer is I don't know how long it's going to take. You know, if the samples work out over the next few months, then it might be, the, be by the end of the year, but I don't think so. I think it's going to take a little bit longer than that, to be sure. Um, at least at the moment, the HD base T, like single point to point ones, Bluestream version's about $600 versus $120 odd dollars for this one. So 
yeah, it's a price premium at the moment, but it's what you have to do, and the colour compression is not an easy thing to achieve either, which is why it's taking as long as it does to get another version of it. So for now, and certainly for the foreseeable future, run the Bluestream ones, run a Kramer, AV Pro, Extron, whatever else it is to run it, and that sort of resolution, that sort of refresh rate, if you need to get all the way to 18 gig, okay? Or avoid the whole issue and just run cable to cable, if you can. Um, or for run fibre, or HDMI via IP, or any of those other ways that you might be able to get the signals there as well. Yeah, Harrison. Yeah, sure. Um, in, so the question's basically regarding USB-C active dongles to connect to HDMI. Um, USB-C is an interesting uh, chipset, an interesting way of doing things. It's capable of running a whole range of different types of things through the same connection. Run power at high, you know, high refresh rates, you can run lots of data through it quickly. Um, high current, I meant before. With the USB-C to HDMI adapters, it really comes down to how good the chipset that is that's in them. Um, and that is something I can't tell you, because every single different manufacturer might be using a different chipset. The same sort of thing as before. When you're running short distances, probably most of them will work fine. You know, a couple of metres to a you know, a local display or a local monitor, no worries. To a portable projector, no worries at all. Running it from a laptop into a wall plate, wall plate via a 15 meter cable up to a projector, that's when we start potentially having some more issues with it. So with things like that, the Meridio tester, you can obviously put the analyzer on it and see what's coming through the other end, but you may need to, on your laptop, drop the resolutions and the refresh rates to try and make it stable at a lower refresh rate, uh, sorry, make it stable to make it work. The 4K may not work depending on the extender and how, well, the USB-C adapter and how long the cable's got to go. They were really designed in most cases for that immediate, I'm on the same desktop and I just want to run an external monitor system. Anything longer than that, 18 gig if you can, but I'd still be looking at dropping resolutions and things, so. And uh, otherwise, test, test, test. Um, buy it, try it, beware that they may not work. Um, don't use them if you're desperate. You know, use them when you've tested it all out completely first. Alrighty. Cool. Thank you very much.